Hall Auditorium. Please take a moment to locate your nearest emergency exit, and at this time, please stop texting and turn off your cell phone. As mandated by federal copyright law, any form of unauthorized recording or photography is strictly prohibited. Also, per JMU Health and Safety Guidelines, all patrons must wear a mask when in Wilson Hall Auditorium. Thank you, and enjoy the event. Good evening. My name is David Owusu Ansa, a professor in the History Department and Associate Provost for Diversity, Executive Director for Faculty Access and Inclusion at JMU. It is my pleasure uh, to find this occasion to talk to you about how this evening began. About a year ago, I had a conversation with the provost uh, because a colleague reminded me of an event at Blue, uh, Blue uh, Bridgewater College, uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day, 27th of January. I have had occasion to visit Bridgewater before. And in fact, last week, 27th, I had the occasion again to do so and we thank uh, our colleagues over there for reminding uh, the attendees of today here at JMU. We decided on the provost's uh, encouragement that we do something here at JMU sponsored from her office. And as a result of that, we put a committee together uh, and the result is what we have here today. On 27 January 1945, the Red Army entered the concentration camp at Auschwitz to end what was a German concentration. It did take several years later, on November 1, 2005, for the United Nations to declare the 27th of January as Holocaust Remembrance Day. Those of you of the faith know that April is Yamashua. That is also a Holocaust Remembrance Day. But this is today the United Nations uh, date. But we decided not to do it on the 27th on the basis of the committee's conversations because we did not want to jam the program at Bridgewater College. And I hope that this will continue so that we can have a twin kind of event over there and here as well. I would like to introduce Provost Heather Coltman, who encouraged us to work towards this date. Uh, I know that intermittently JMU has done different things in the past, but this is a committee and I believe that the Provost's assistance is going to be very useful. So on behalf of myself and the committee, I just want to introduce the provost to welcome us to tonight. Thank you. Provost Coltman. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. A Holocaust commemoration event is a sobering, passionate, heartfelt, painful time. And I hope that you will all take a moment to consider what we are commemorating, what we are remembering, and if any of you have been to Yad Vashem, or Mauthausen, or Auschwitz-Birkenau, you know what it feels like to commemorate the Holocaust. And yet, in amongst all of that, we have tremendous hope and faith in our future. So I'm very glad that you're all here, and please take a moment to really think through the lessons of this event. Thank you. Welcome, all of you, to tonight's talk, The Stakes of the Holocaust Commemoration, Some Lessons for the 21st Century. This is obviously a challenging topic that we are confronting during a challenging time in our world. 
For those of you that have questions that arise during the talk, please ask for a note card that will be passed up to our moderators after the formal remarks from our speaker. Along with tonight's talk, I invite all of you to explore related learning opportunities on our website. Please visit jmu.edu slash civic. There you will find information about an exhibit at the Lisenby Museum called Out of Darkness, a Holocaust Remembrance Day exhibition featuring Jewish artists in the Madison Art Collection. The exhibit will actually be up until April. Also, please check out a very special book display called In Memory, The Holocaust and Society, which was created by Dr. Mara Hametz and Malia Wiley from JMU Libraries. I would like to give special thanks to the sponsors, the planning committee, and many others who helped make this evening possible. Our work honors the spirit of our late colleague and friend, Dr. Terry Beitzel, whom I know would be proud of our efforts tonight. Finally, I have the opportunity to introduce our speaker, Dr. Oren Steer. He is the director of Holocaust and Genocide Program and professor of religious studies at Florida International University. His full bio is on the program, but I want to share something that is not. Dr. Steer deals with a horrifying topic, and while doing so, is among the warmest, kindest, most collaborative and thoughtful speakers I've ever worked with. It is my high honor to welcome him to JMU and to welcome him to the stage, Dr. Oren Steer. Thank you, Abe. Thank you to everyone who's here today. Uh, I really am so honored to have been invited and to have this opportunity to speak to you for this inaugural event. I want to begin with some words of thanks. We say in Hebrew, hakarat hatov, appreciation of the good, recognition of the good. So I want to thank first and foremost um, Mora Hametz for uh, being the first person to reach out to me from the planning committee on behalf of the planning committee. Um, and she really got the whole ball rolling, and I'm so grateful to her for that. Um, and she handed the baton over to uh, Abe Goldberg uh, and, uh, with Logan Ziegler, and I, we've been meeting on Zoom regularly and discussing plans for my day here. And I'm so thoroughly grateful for all of their kindness and collaboration in planning today's activities. Um, I'm also grateful to uh, Cara Whaley and Kristen McCleary um, for inviting me to their classrooms today. We had very fruitful discussions, and I really appreciated getting to know some of the JMU students and seeing what you're working on and what you're thinking about and I want to hope, uh, wish that you go, as we say um, uh, in the Hebrew expression, from strength to strength. I want to thank, even though they're not here, Rabbi Morty and Nomi Leimdorfer um, for taking such good care of my dietary needs uh, for my visit um, in absentia. But uh, they packed up meals for me so I could have kosher meals while I was visiting the Shenandoah Valley, and I'm grateful for that. I had a wonderful opportunity to meet earlier today with Provost Heather Coltman and Associate Provost for Diversity, Dr. David Owusu Ansa, um, whom you just heard from, and I appreciated them sharing a little bit of time with me so we could talk about the importance of today's event. I also got a chance to meet with some uh, JMU Hillel students, particularly Jenny Weiss and Avi Stein. They are going to be running the Q&A at the end of the talk. Um, and Jenny Weiss also curated an exhibition uh, that I strongly urge everyone to go see out of the darkness, a Holocaust Remembrance Day exhibition, uh, which is at, um, it's from the Madison Art Collection, which is directed by Jenny Sankson, whom I also had the opportunity to meet today. I just want to thank again the planning committee and everyone um, who's responsible for helping make it happen, um, the ASL interpreters, the um, staff uh, behind the stage who made sure that everything's working properly for my PowerPoint.
I began seriously thinking about this talk around 9-11, the, the, the 20th anniversary milestone, which last September coincided with the Sabbath immediately preceding Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, which is known as Shabbat Shuva, the Sabbath of return or repentance. And I started thinking about how 9-11 memory already seems to be fading and about what we might do as a society to make it more active and relevant to a generation like many of my students, like many of the students here, growing up with no personal memory of the Twin Towers. It got me thinking about what is at stake in any kind of public memorial activity. Why commemoration even matters. I'm reminded of Elie Wiesel's Nobel Prize lecture in which he wrote, and I quote, Remembering is a noble and necessary act. The call of memory, the call to memory, reaches us from the very dawn of history. No commandment figures so frequently, so insistently in the Bible. It's incumbent upon us to remember the good we have received and the evil we have suffered. New Year's Day, Rosh Hashanah, is also called Yom Hazikaron, the Day of Memory. On that day, the day of universal judgment, man appeals to God to remember. Our salvation depends on it. If God wishes to remember our suffering, all will be well. If God refuses, all will be lost. Thus, the rejection of memory becomes a divine curse, one that would doom us to repeat past disasters, past wars. End of quote. But how and what do we remember? Who does the remembering? What do we do if there are competing memories of a given event? Indeed, a key characteristic of social public memory is that it is always contested. I want to examine with you this afternoon some battles over memory, past and present, as well as selected examples of memorial projects that anticipate these conflicts and embed within them a kind of memorial dramatic friction that I argue allows memorialization to emerge more vividly and more vigorously. These are current and urgent issues. Take the debate in Richmond, for example, over the Robert E. Lee Monument by French sculptor Antonin Mercier that used to stand as the last and most prominent of six Confederate statues on Monument Avenue that were the heart of Richmond's identity. Following the murder of George Floyd, it became a vibrant protest site beginning in June 2020. As artists, dancers, and musicians reclaimed the space for a wider and more diverse population in the context of Black Lives Matter demonstrations, and Richmond's mayor and Virginia's then governor declared that it would be removed. These counter memorial performances continued while efforts to remove the monument were mired in a year of legal battles. Until the largest Confederate monument in the United States was finally dismantled last September. The stakes of commemoration were very much on display in Richmond over that year. Which brings up my title. If something is at stake, it means it is at risk of loss or damage. When we identify the stakes of something, we're saying those are the things that may be gained or lost, that there are consequences for, in this case, the public memory of the Civil War, or recalling my main topic tonight, how we remember the Holocaust. The biggest consequence is collective amnesia societal forgetfulness. Let me bring another example. The case of Emmett Till. 
As reported in a remarkable and moving article by Wright Thompson in The Atlantic last year, most public recall of the terrible story of Emmett Till leaves out one crucial part of the narrative. The 14-year-old Till's torture and likely murder in a barn in Drew, Mississippi, next to the rented home of Leslie Milam, half-brother of Till's acquitted murderers, J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant. Most people and most sources remove the barn from the narrative and think Till died in Money, Mississippi, the same place where Till whistled at Bryant's wife outside the family's store. But Till was actually abducted a few nights later and tortured for several hours in that barn, 45 minutes away from money. The barn and its role in a gruesome episode of an already gruesome story have disappeared. The barn remains unmarked memorially. Back to my title. Commemoration is a type of memorialization. The Oxford English Dictionary gives, quote, a calling to remembrance or preserving in memory by some solemn observance, public celebration, etc., solemnization of the memory of anything from the Latin commemorare to bring to remembrance, make mention of. I chose this term deliberately because it connotes public activity, performance, and because it holds within it the prefix, the, the calm, indicating something done with or together with someone else. I'll return to this. Note, however, that I'm working with a broad notion of commemoration, one that can include various examples of memorials, monuments, and acts of remembrance one that encompasses memorials both permanent and ephemeral, from small to large scale, one that includes even challenges to and attacks on memory itself. Consider Charlottesville, not so far away. As you all know too well, controversy over proposals to remove another statue of General Lee one memorial conflict inspired a counter commemoration in the violent and ultimately deadly August 2017 Unite the Right rally, with its own visible and audible echoes of Nazi era imagery and ideology. Jews will not replace us! Jews will not replace us! Why include this here? Indeed, why mention Richmond or Emmett Till in my talk today? Because public memory of the Holocaust and of other difficult histories is a high stakes competition for attention for resources, and over the very meaning of the past for people in the present. And also because Charlottesville, where white supremacists used Nazi slogans and imagery as they rallied to protest efforts to right the wrongs of celebrating a racist past, Charlottesville reminds us that we cannot and should not disentangle apparently disparate varieties of 20th century racism. I'm interested in commemoration 
as a stepping off point because the term accentuates in its best examples complex intersections of temporality and geography. Commemoration connotes an event at a time and in a place that are, if not sacred, then certainly infused with symbolic meaning. The place is often, though not always, the site of the event being commemorated, and the time often the anniversary of that event. A good example of the effective intersection of time and space is something called the March of the Living, which is an annual pilgrimage that brings thousands of Jewish teens from all over the world to Poland to converge in Auschwitz on Yom HaShoah, Israel's Holocaust Memorial Day, occurring every year five days after the end of Passover for a massive three-kilometer march from the Auschwitz I mother camp to Auschwitz II Birkenau, the primary killing center of the Auschwitz camp network. At their destination, while speeches are delivered from a stage, participants mark the territory which is really a massive, otherwise unmarked gravesite with handmade memorial plaques. But often, special dates on the calendar have themselves become unmoored from any geographical locations to which they were once tethered, or conversely, memorial ceremonies take place at the sites where the original events occurred, but at unremarked times. Or it may even be the case that effective commemoration occurs at a site that marks neither the place nor the time of original events. As, for example, Maya Lin's Vietnam Memorial, where we can consider the memorial activities of the veterans and family members who visit it at all hours, light candles, and make rubbings of the names. Why are such memorial activities so successful? I hope that by the end of this talk, we'll have some ways to think about and perhaps answer this question. To begin to unravel these complex issues, let us consider monuments and memorials in general. Now, there are certainly differences between monuments and memorials. Historian Harold Marcuse suggests the former monuments are more heroic, the latter memorials more contemplative. Think, for example, a Washington Monument versus Lincoln Memorial. But that distinction is not our concern today. We note, rather, that while neither monuments nor memorials need to be temporally or spatially commemorative, when they are so, they're especially powerful. They access a special kind of power and resonance because of their relationship to historical space and time. We will look at a few of these later in this talk. Altogether, I'm focusing on what I call memorial activism, a construct that lies somewhere at the intersection of politics, theater, media, history, and society. What links disparate examples of memorial activist intervention together under this broad conceptualization of commemoration is their performativity, the ways they enact memory. Commemoration ceremonies are certainly public performances, whether they take place at monuments and memorials or not. But some memorials and monuments by themselves, even on their off days, can exude a powerful performativity. I want to examine the issues surrounding Holocaust memorialization and commemoration as active performance by looking at a range of examples and asking both how they enact and contest memory, and also what we might then learn from these enactments and contests in ways we can apply to Holocaust memorialization and to other efforts at public commemoration in the 21st century. These issues might include the aforementioned friction or implied drama in Holocaust memorials. It could include 
self-representation. And then there are some things that I'm not really going to get to in my talk, but I want to just call out, and maybe we can discuss it during the Q&A, but the use of AR and VR, of augmented reality and virtual reality layering over existing sites, uh, the wearing of badges or other signifying clothing, and of course the perennial issue of the echoes of Nazism in certain kinds of commemoration activities. I'm not going to address all of that tonight. I'm going to let you go home. Before we get to contemporary battles over commemoration, I want to address some early cases drawn primarily from New York City in the 1940s. One reason for doing this is to challenge the notion that commemoration is largely passive and only happens after historical events have run their course. And to propose, as I will do more fully towards the end of the talk, that it is in linking the commemorative impulse to real and ongoing threats to memory. In the case of Holocaust memory, one threat would be contemporary anti-Semitism. It's in linking them that commemoration of the past might find renewed vigor and relevance. I also have to say that I find some eerie similarities between the US in the 1940s and today, 80 years later, that I hope I can accentuate by presenting them. Possibly the earliest known commemorative gathering against Nazism in the US and its assault on European Jewry occurred on the eve of the ninth day of the Hebrew month of Av, the communal fast day originally commemorating the destruction of the Jewish temples in Jerusalem. This was July 11th, 1942, when the American Jewish Congress, B'nai B'rith, the Jewish Labor Committee, and the American Jewish Committee organized a mass protest at Madison Square Garden in New York City. There's the ticket. The New York Times reported that 20,000 crowded inside while thousands more stood outside to protest Nazi atrocities, express their grief and indignation, and call for American and United Nations action on behalf of European Jewry. This protest was held in response to the first reports in June 1942. I'm going to say that date again in case you didn't catch it. June 1942, the first reports of mass gassing at Chelmno, reported by Shmuel Zeigelboim, a Jewish member of the Polish National Council in Exile and a former member of the Warsaw Judenrat, the city's Nazi-appointed Jewish governing council, prior to the construction of the infamous Warsaw Ghetto. His report was widely covered in the Jewish press, though, alas, not the non-Jewish press. Nonetheless, by November and December 1942, public acts of protests, fasting, prayer, mourning, work stoppages, minutes of radio and school silence, school store closures, and more, were being held worldwide, often with non-Jewish groups joining in or holding their own observances. Now, just so we get a sense for the memorial conflict here, so we get a sense for what these public acts of protest were up against, I want to call our attention to another case in which Madison Square Garden in New York City was used as a stage some two and a half years earlier, on February 20th, 1939, when American Nazis, sorry, the German American Bund, American Nazis, held a pro-America rally in front of an enormous mural of George Washington before a raucous crowd of 22,000 as documented in the award-winning short documentary film, A Night at the Garden. Watch this clip featuring Fritz Kuhn, the Bund's leader. Ladies 
ladies and gentlemen, fellow Americans, American patriots, I'm sure I do not come before you tonight as a complete stranger. You all have heard of me through the Jewish controlled press as a creature with horns, a cloven hoof, and a long tail. We, with American ideals, demand that our government shall be returned to the American people who founded it. If we kept watching, we would also see protester Isidore Greenbaum, a 26-year-old plumber's helper from Brooklyn, who rushed the stage and managed to punch Kuhn before being set upon by Kuhn's Nazi thugs and then the NYPD. Where did, oh, there he is. No, nope. oops, okay. You didn't see those other slides yet. You would also see the whole crowd recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I really recommend the film. We see from this example that the same site can be used for radically different forms of commemoration. But there's more. Returning to 1942, not everyone was satisfied with the nature of Jewish protest activity at the time. For example, there was Peter Berkson, who began working in 1938 for the Irgun, the underground Zionist nationalist paramilitary organization led by Zev Jabotinsky in Poland, helping to smuggle Jews to Palestine. Bergson then came with Jabotinsky in 1940 to the US to raise funds for a range of interrelated activist organizations. Through these organizations, Bergson and his group worked to support the Jewish underground in Palestine, and then shifted audaciously once World War II broke out to establishing a Jewish army. And then, once the mass murder of Jews became clear, they shifted attention once again to the project of rescuing European Jews and lobbying the American government to intervene to end the Nazi murder of Jews. The Bergson Group's activities were beyond the pale in terms of the more typically conservative Jewish organized protests. They were bold, aggressive, and dramatic. Supported by the likes of Hollywood screenwriter Ben Hecht and artist Arthur Schick, they were single-minded in their efforts to get the public's attention. And from 1933 to 1943 to 44, the group placed more than 200 ads in American newspapers with provocative headlines such as, I'm quoting, how well are you sleeping? Is there something you could have done to save millions of innocent people from torture and death? I see an echo of this technique in a contemporary set of billboards that I just couldn't resist including, created by the Jew Belong campaign. This one, we're just 75 years since the gas chamber, so no, a billboard calling out anti-Semitism isn't an overreaction. And this one from Times Square, being woke and anti-Semitic is like being a vegan who eats veal. Yeah, you should laugh. Back to the Bergson Group. On February 16, 1943, in response to the news report in the New York Times three days earlier that Romania was proposing to the United Nations to transfer, for a price, to transfer Jews out of Romania's Far East, the group took out this shocking full-page ad in the Times. In case you can't read it, it says, for sale to humanity, 70,000 Jews guaranteed human beings at $50 apiece. Like I said, they were provocative. When the American Jewish Congress heard that the Bergson Group was planning a mass rally at Madison Square Garden, they quickly preempted with their own event on March 1st, 1943. Titled Stop Hitler Now, it reportedly drew 75,000 people. I don't know exactly how that works, but that's what the reports say. 
and announced an 11-point program for the Allies and the UN to immediately provide safe havens for Jews. Not to be outdone, the Bergson Group opened their long-planned pageant, We Will Never Die, at Madison Square Garden on March 9th and 10th, with two performances before touring nationally and getting a lot of press along the way. This is the poster by Arthur Schick, by the way. It was an all-star production written by Ben Hecht, scored by Kurt Weil, produced by Billy Rose, directed by Moss Hart, and starring Paul Mooney and Edward G. Robinson as narrators. The pageant, We Will Never Die, is New York's Jewish protest against Nazi massacre. In Lublin, 500 of our women and children were led to the marketplace and stood against the vegetable stalls we knew so well. Here the Germans turned machine guns on us and killed us all. Remember us. And a great dramatic appeal is made as Paul Muni tells of Nazi crimes against helpless people. There are four million Jews surviving in Europe. The Germans have promised to deliver to the world by the end of the year a Christmas package of four million dead Jews. And this is not a Jewish problem. It is a problem that belongs to humanity and it is a challenge to the soul of man. Then a lament for two million people. Included among the cast of several hundred were 20 Orthodox rabbis who had escaped Nazi-occupied Europe, holding torn Torah scrolls, reciting Kaddish, a prayer recited by mourners. Suddenly, it seemed, there was a lot of public attention being paid to the plight of the Jews of Europe. And remember, this is 1943. While it's not clear whether these public performances had any immediate impact on behavior, they certainly raised awareness and one might argue helped pave the way for eventual U.S. government response to the Holocaust. Notably, one month later, the now famous uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto began, contributing a new scene to the still touring We Will Never Die pageant and leading to more observances worldwide, Jewish and non-Jewish. Sadly, upon hearing of the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto, Shmuel Zeigelboim, whose June 1942 report brought some of the first news of the genocide against Jews in Europe, committed suicide on March 12, 1943. The news of the liquidation also led to more demonstrations and rallies worldwide including commemorations in 1944 on the one-year anniversary of the start of the uprising in Warsaw and calls for a monument there, which was designed by Nathan Rappaport, built literally on the ruins of the ghetto and unveiled on the fifth anniversary of the uprising, April 19, 1948. The Warsaw Ghetto Monument has served from then until now as a stage for some of the most important Holocaust commemorations. Here is West German Chancellor Willy Brandt apologetically falling to his knees at a memorial ceremony on December 7, 1970. Commemorative performances shifted dramatically after the end of the war and the realization of the extent of Nazi crimes towards expressions of mourning and survivor-driven activities. 
This is neither the time nor the place to go over an entire history of post-war memorialization efforts. I'll just note that the earliest commemoration ceremonies in the post-war displaced persons camps set the form and tone for most of the many worldwide ceremonies to follow, with a mix of prayers, songs, and anthems. At the same time, early European memorials were soon built, sticking closely to a classic and static monumental design standard. But these early commemorations and memorials are not my topic today. What I do want to stress instead is the urgency of the commemorative efforts in the 1940s that called attention to the plight of European Jewry while they were still being murdered. An urgency that lent greater purpose to those efforts and created a kind of friction in their performances and representations that made them into visceral enactments, real dramas, the invocations of some things very much at stake. For the remainder of my talk tonight, I want to explore the nature and implications of varying degrees of such dramatic friction for memorial activities in the present. Two examples of memorials that wordlessly introduce this symbolic friction are in Budapest and in Berlin, respectively. The installation in Budapest, Shoes on the Danube Bank Promenade, features 60 iron pairs of men's, women's, and children's shoes fixed in the concrete with signs in Hungarian, English, and Hebrew reading, quote, to the memory of victims shot into the Danube by Arrow Cross militiamen in 1944-1945. Created by film director Ken Togai and the sculptor Gyula Power, it was unveiled in 2005 on the Pest side of the river. I think it's self-explanatory that the shoes are what's left behind after the people who have been shot, as the inscription reads, into the Danube. The latter, in Berlin, is titled The Abandoned or Deserted Room. It's a modest installation in the residential neighborhood of Koppenplatz in East Berlin's Mitte district, and includes as an inscription running along the perimeter of the false parquet floor, the Nellie Sachs poem, quote, oh, the houses of death invitingly appointed for the landlord of the house who was once a guest, oh, you fingers laying the threshold like a knife between life and death, oh, you chimney stacks, oh, you fingers, and the body of Israel going up in smoke. Designed by Carl Biederman and Eva Butzmann for a memorial competition they won in 1989, it was finally built and unveiled in 1996. Both of these memorials in Budapest and in Berlin are in public urban spaces and are highly legible. Although some visitors do think that the Ber Berlin example is a memorial to the poet, the poet Nelly Sachs. Both of these memorials show us how a memorial can inscribe the memory of the past back into the landscape, even without a commemoration ceremony to formally enact that memory. At a greater level of societal and civic engagement, we can also consider the Stolperstein project. In 1996, Artist Gunter Demnig began traveling around Germany, laying brass nameplate stones, each of them handmade by Michael Friedrichs Friedlander at a rate of 450 a month, that sit ever so slightly above the sidewalk surface. The intent of the project 
was to remind people that the victims of Nazism lived in their communities and should be commemorated there. As to the name, Demnig's website credits a child who responded to the question whether people could actually stumble on a Stolperstein, right? It means stumbling stone. So a child asked, can somebody really stumble on it? And Demnig reportedly responded, you don't trip on a Stolperstein, you stumble with your, hand, with your head and with your heart. Sorry, that's, that's what Demnig credits the child as saying. The 70, the 700, sorry, the 75 thousandth Stolperstein was installed in December 2019. I'm just realizing right before COVID started. Stolperstein can be found in 2,000 sites throughout Europe. And Demnig always places the first stone in any town or city. There he is. According to the artist's vision, each stone is meant to commemorate one victim of Nazism, whether murdered or not. So, for example, it's possible for stones to be placed together to memorialize victims and surviving family members together, returning individuality to those the Nazis wanted to group and take away their individuality. Each stone is installed with the support of the victim or survivor's relatives in front of that person's last residence of choice. That is, not places to which victims were forced to move, such as Judenhauser, the Jew houses, which are sites where Jews were housed involuntarily, and certainly not at any labor camps or death camps, places that they were taken to involuntarily. The stones typically begin with the heading, here lived so-and-so. Now, there are also about 25 Stolperschwellen, which are, translates as stumbling thresholds, which are installed at select locations where there were many victims at the same address, making it almost impossible to build, to create Stolpersteine for each one of them. These are factories or nursing homes, for example. The Stolperstein are interesting because they're designed to interrupt present day lives, to force passers-by to pause if they notice them, and consider them in their contexts, thereby creating minor local memorial performances, dramas of realization. The Stolperstein are highly attuned to the issue of local remembrance and invite reflection and conversation about local historical awareness and responsibility potentially connecting visitors to the real consequences of Nazi policies. This is a slide of a group of physicians at a hospital who annually on November 9th, which is the anniversary of Kristallnacht, come out to clean up the Stolperstein that are there to memorialize those who were in their predecessor's care at that hospital. Finally, I'm going to mention just one more level of commemorative engagement. We've been moving from the implied dramas in Budapest and Berlin to the uh, more active kinds of dramas in the case of the Stolpersteine. And now I want to talk about photographic self-representations, selfies. Selfies at memorial sites. By nature, this is a more recent phenomenon, and it results from a combination of factors, including a very typical normal tourist desire to document oneself at memorable sites and attractions, right? The, to, in order to prove, really, that you were there. 
coupled with the technological means enabling anyone to take a self-portrait with their cell phone. And of course, this is outside the Arbeit macht frei gate at the Auschwitz One camp. Now, social media is an important method for Holocaust museums and memorials worldwide to connect with audiences, particularly younger ones. Indeed, the Auschwitz Museum has its own social media accounts where it even posts visitor-created photos. And we can't fairly condemn all self-photography at serious sites since, as Pavel Sawitsky, he is the um, director of the Auschwitz Museum media office, essentially, as Sawitzki has pointed out, sometimes visitors indicate with captions and their own demeanor that they're aware of the gravity of the memorial and wish to simply add their own commemoration to it. So we can't condemn all selfies. But there are cases that cross a line. Enough that in 2019, the Auschwitz Museum needed to request via Twitter, no less. Quote, when you come to at Auschwitz Museum, remember you were at the site where over one million people were killed. Respect their memory. There are better places to learn how to walk on a balance beam than the site which symbolizes deportation of hundreds of thousands to their deaths, end quote. Now, some have been decidedly less polite in their response to selfies of questionable propriety. In 2017, the artist Shahak Shapira created a website called Yolocost, that's Y-O-L-O, -O, Yolocost, in which he publicly shamed 12 tourists who had posted selfies to their social media accounts taken at the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe. This memorial, a very, very problematic memorial, but that's a different talk. Berlin's difficult, abstract Holocaust mon monument, designed by Peter Eisenman, opened in 2005, consisting of some 2,710 concrete stelae of varying heights arranged in a grid in an undulating field just south of the Brandenburg Gate and the American Embassy. Shapira, the artist, had superimposed the selfies that he collected onto historical atrocity photos in order to make a point. Out of sensitivity, I'm showing you one of two that do not display emaciated corpses, which is to say that the other 10 do. You might recognize that photo. But Shapira also posted a potential remedy for the shamed visitors. They could write him to ask to be removed from his site. All 12 did so, apologizing for their callous behavior and removing the selfies from their own social media accounts. And Shapira removed the photos from his, and in fact, it's it's only archived now. If you go to the Yolo cost, you, you, you won't find it. You have to kind of find the archived version. Um, that's a shout out to organizations like the Internet Archive that, that archive stuff like that. These tourists in Berlin and in Auschwitz are putting themselves literally in the picture. And this teaches us finally something widely applicable about Holocaust memorials in the 21st century and the importance of the co in commemoration. What these memorial performances I've just surveyed do at varying degrees of civic, social, and moral engagement is bring the contemporary individual in close contact into close contact with the events and people being commemorated, to which they otherwise might have very little relationship. 
While I personally find selfie behavior problematic, I appreciate what it can achieve. A heightened personal connection to the Shoah through an individual act of remembrance. I think 21st century Holocaust commemoration could use many more of these individual enactments supported by memorial environments that are legible and convey some aspect of the real dramas they were built to commemorate. Because otherwise, the generations born long after will eventually find no access points at all to a past they find increasingly distant. Certainly, those who hate, like the Unite the Right marchers in Charlottesville, are finding ways to connect to the past and put themselves in the picture. They participate in their own memorial enactments, their own performances of, in this case, Nazi ideology. We all need to learn how to respond, and respond we must. Such response takes a variety of forms. In Charlottesville, the monument that sparked such a ruckus is gone. And last December, the city council voted unanimously for the proposal from, uh, from the organization called Swords into Plowshares to melt the 1,100-pound bronze statue down into ingots that would then be used to create a new community-based artistic project that would be donated back to the city. This is commemorative alchemy, transforming a symbol associated with white supremacy into one that it is hoped will represent a diverse population's memory of the past. In Richmond, one distinctive memorial response is embodied in Rumors of War by Kahinda Wiley, best known for his official portrait of President Barack Obama, which hangs in the National Portrait Gallery. Installed in December 2019 at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts on Arthur Ashe Boulevard, it stands just a few blocks away from the site of the former Lee Monument and deliberately echoes another monument removed in July 2020, that of General J.E.B. Stewart. But Wiley's figure is no Confederate general. This young African-American writer, dreadlocks in a top knot, wearing a hoodie, torn jeans and Nikes, is frozen in dramatic action, turning to the right as his horse looks left. The caption to the photo sources the title in a biblical passage, Matthew 24, 6, quote, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come, end quote. But Richmond's memorial response had begun while the monument to General Lee was still intact and was not embodied only in massive public artworks like Wiley's. Indeed, that response is symbolized most elegantly, in my opinion, by this viral photo of 14-year-old dancers Kennedy George and Ava Holloway, both of them students at the Central Virginia Dance Academy then, and I want to note the same age then as Emmett Till was when he was murdered. That, finally, brings me back to the unmarked site, the unmemorialized, forgotten place of the barn, site of Till's torture, and likely murder. Jeff Andrews, the current owner of the property, 
did not know about the barn's history when he purchased the site, and he has said that it doesn't bother him. But when pressed by Wright Thompson in his interview with him for his article, with reports that his family had seen noises and lights and felt strange movements, and I'm quoting Thompson's article here, he hemmed and hawed, but eventually told me that his daughter believes Till's spirit is on their land, that their home is haunted by the memory of the boy who died there. Let that sit for a moment. I'm still quoting. If ghosts aren't real, which they're not, and if these apparitions are the only way for deeply buried feelings to find the light of day, then the gap between what the Andreses allow themselves to know and what they keep buried inside is the exact gap that memorials are designed to bridge. The exact gap that memorials are designed to bridge. And so, the lessons we learn from Holocaust commemoration are about response and responsibility, about marking places with our own commitments to truth, to the truth of history, made all the more urgent in an era in which truth is elusive, fleeting, negotiable. They are about bringing the past closer through performances that create points of access and engagement that allow us, that require us, to connect to history, to memory, and to each other in community. These are the lessons I think are most important for the 21st century. But allow me to conclude with a moving example of one memorial response to Nazism and its long shadow, which occurred during the celebration leading up to the installation of a new Torah scroll, a true celebration, a new Torah scroll for a synagogue in Vienna. Such a celebration would normally involve a progression, a procession with the Torah scroll to its new location, a public procession. And in this case, 94-year-old participant, he's in the middle there, the shorter one. Survivor, Rabbi Harav Yisachar Dov Ber Karen, who paused during the procession at the spot where 83 years earlier, a gang of Nazi youths had almost beaten him to death in that very spot, and, reciting the he and recited the Hebrew blessing, Baruch Shasali Nes, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who made for me a miracle in this place. A rare blessing, pronounced when someone encounters a site of miraculous deliverance. There's a plaque at that site as well, but I don't imagine anyone noticed it that day. Thank you. I think we have some questions, and I'm wondering if we can bring the house lights up for that. Oh, thank you. All right, hello everyone, and thank you again so much. So we're going to, sorry, Jenny's just coming up to join. 
So we're going to start with one of the questions that was submitted before, which is, why did you get into studying Holoco the Holocaust and genocide? Right. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I really don't know. Um, uh, I, I realized not really in my youth um, kind of the, the, the depth of, of my family association with, with the Holocaust. Um, and it's a long story that I, I'm not gonna get into here. So I, I think I'm just gonna say at this point that um, I, I was born in Israel. Uh, my, my parents are, are Israeli. Uh, I grew up in the US always kind of knowing I was just kind of like a little bit different um, in my background. And I think that tuned me in to a, a little bit more of a sense of difference in identity. And uh, the real truth of it is that I took a course in college, um, which was, um, I didn't realize it at the time, but it was a rare thing to have a, a, a course in Holocaust literature in college in the 80s, um, in the mid 80s. And I, I took a class and it proverbially, you know, changed my life. It was one of those things that I just, I was fascinated by it in, in a way that I was sort of endlessly fascinated. Like, I just knew this was a bottomless well, that I would never figure it all out. And somehow that attracted me. Thank you. On the topic of literature, um, there were a couple questions about how the Tennessee School Board recently banned mouse in public schools. Um, how do you, do you see this remo the removal of this book as a prevention of education about the Holocaust, or how does that impact how we remember or memorialize the Holocaust? Yeah, it's a, it's a loaded question. Um, I, you know, I think one of the things that really bothered me about that issue, um, it's still very fresh, and I think we're, we're, we still don't know kind of the full impact and how it's gonna resolve, and maybe it'll resolve in a different way with all the pro protests that are happening. Um, but I was very struck by the unanimity of the decision. I mean, I, I, I read, the little bit that I read about it, there was some kind of tepid opposition, but it was really, it was a unanimous vote against using a document that, as I spoke earlier in, in Professor McCleary's class, I mean, one of the things that's so remarkable about Mouse is that it's very difficult to define exactly what it is. And because of that problem with, with genre, with definition, it really invites so much discussion, so much engagement. That if, if you've never seen it, you have no idea how completely, immediately enthralling Mouse is. And therefore, it's an amazing teaching tool. I mean, if we're looking for ways to engage people, there's something right there that is so engaging that speaks a language in an idiom that students today can relate to. And the board, I don't know what they're thinking. You know, if they think these are, you know, inappropriate, dirty pictures, they, they, they didn't open it up and look at it themselves. Uh, these aren't photographs. Um, they're, 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 they're graphic representations. It's like telling somebody don't look at graffiti as you drive down the road because of what you might see there. I, there was more to that question. I kind of forgot the rest of it though. Um, it was just sort of about how literature can help us to commemorate and memorialize the Holocaust as well. Well, I mean, that's the whole thing, right? It's about, it's about drawing people in and I, narrative can do that, um, different kinds of narrative, different forms, whatever, whatever works, you know, to get people to um, find that connection, find that relevancy, find something that allows them to, to have a doorway into history that is perceived as, uh, you know, long ago and far away, uh, which was the title of a very important exhibition of Auschwitz artifacts that is also um, everybody should see. Uh, another question, so how can Holocaust remembrance lead to productive conversations and actions that support Jewish students on college campuses amidst rising incidents of anti-Semitism? Sorry, the last part? 
uh, lead to productive conversations and actions that support Jewish students on college campuses amidst rising instances of anti-Semitism. Yeah, amidst rising instances of anti-Semitism. I mean, look, it's, it's a reality that anti-Semitism is rising, right? And so I think um, there are productive, sensitive ways to use um, a Holocaust uh, commemoration and representation as ways in to try to get people to see the, 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 the gravity of the situation, the seriousness of anti-Semitism and where it might lead. Um, so, you know, you're not necessarily going to change a hardcore anti-Semite's mind, but maybe you could change the minds of the people around them. Um, and and I, I think most, well, I don't know if it's most, a good proportion of anti-Semitism is thoughtless, it's careless, and it doesn't think about real issues and real consequences, and those are the people whose minds we can change. And dealing, again, with truth and reality um, in an age-appropriate way uh, is, is a very powerful tool against that. So we're going now to some, some questions from the floor on the cards. We have one more question, um, okay. actually a grouping of several questions that was submitted through the online um, okay. pre-registration. Um, there were a bunch of questions asking about um, how we can respond to Holocaust deniers because there are, unfortunately, many people who still deny that the Holocaust happened. Um, and you were mentioning talking about sort of placing things in space and time and how can memorials that do that sort of help to reach these people? Right, so I mean, we don't, we don't have the resources to take all the Holocaust deniers on a trip to Auschwitz um, to show them the place, and I don't even know if it would work. Um, again, hardcore deniers are completely steeped in their own fantasy world. It has nothing to do with reality and we're not really gonna change their minds. Um, we need to take them seriously, but I actually believe we don't need to take them too seriously. Um, I think we need to be wary of um, inflating their importance. We're, we're, we're very careful in the world of Holocaust commemoration and education uh, not to debate Holocaust deniers, right? They want a platform to present their vision of what they think is real, which is not, and a debate will elevate that fantasy into some level of reality. So that's not a good idea. Um, but, you know, again, try to, try to pick, off, pick off the hangers on, right? Pull them away from the influence and um, uh, sh show, them, show them truth, show them reality. Don't show them Schindler's List. Right? Don't show them the boy in striped pajamas. Don't show them um, fiction or fictionalizations because they're, they're very sensitive to those nuances, right? Based on a true story is not enough for a Holocaust denier, right? But give them testimonies, right? Give them documentaries. Um, make them watch nine and a half hours of Claude Lanzmann's Shoah, and if they, you know, if they sit till the end, maybe, maybe their minds can be opened. But again, you know, unfortunately, there are people who are going to insist on their their vision of the world. Um, they they seem to be increasingly involved in politics these days, um, and that's unfortunate. Um, and uh, we we need to work harder to educate. Uh, and, and change people's minds at the ground level, right, where it starts. Um, many states have mandated Holocaust education. We need to strengthen those mandates. Uh, we need to work with those states to make sure that they have good materials and well-trained teachers who can uh, impart truth to their students and, and, and deal with the, the, the fallout from the difficult material that they're engaging with in order that learning uh, can be advanced and that truth can be advanced. 
Okay, great. So now we have a couple of questions from the floor. Just, you have mentioned the civic and moral implications of remembrance and commemoration. What is our responsibility as educators to move from knowledge to action? What's our responsibility as educators to move from knowledge to action? Um, I think this is, this is, this is a problem not in, in, in Holocaust education. This is a problem in, in education. Uh, uh, and, and, and what is kind of, there's something happening in the world of education. On one hand, a lot of students, I come from a very big public university um, where students are, God bless them, they're, they're, uh, they have families, they work, they have lives. They are in Miami and of Miami and so fully incorporated into the fabric of, uh, of, of, the urban, uh, of an urban environment. Um, and they don't want to waste any time. They're not there spending their parents' money, they're often spending their own money. They want to get an education in order to get a job, in order to advance themselves, in order to pro progress in a career, whatever it is that they want to do. And so, unfortunately, humanities and the liberal arts are suffering as a result. And we need to figure out how to respond to that. And I think one way is to try to make a lot of education a little bit more practical. I'm not saying the same thing as you know, turning all universities into, into technical schools, but I am saying that, you know, think of projects, uh, capstone projects that students can do in classes where they have some connection to the real world, right? So have the class write an op-ed piece for the local newspaper or letters to the editor. Um, or get engaged in, in, in the debates that are happening around memorials or monuments in their, in their localities. But to, to find a way to bridge that gap, right? The, the old idea of the university as some sort of, you know, isolated city on a hill, it's, it's not working anymore. And I think we need to transition to something that is much more engaged. And through that engagement, we can, we can make a difference. Um, all right, our next question is, can you speak about the politi politicalization of remembrance and what we should do when difficult knowledge is attempted to be silenced? When it is attempted to be? Silenced. Silenced. Huh. Um, I'm a guest in your state. <laughs> so I, I need to be polite. Um, One, memory is always political. I, I think that was one of the first points I tried to make. Um, it is. There, there's nothing we can do about that. And you can look at, for example, Holocaust memorialization, which was transnational, and you can look at different places where the Holocaust is commemorated and see how the national agendas are played out in those different memorialization projects. Um, but the threat to memory and, and the truth of history is real. And um, what can I say? We need, to, we need to fight against it. You know, um, to take it out of the local context, just, um, just yesterday I read an, uh, a, an op-ed uh, in the New York Times by Professor Jan Grabowski. Um, who was caught up in a whole uh, legal case in Poland because he was ex accused of, of maligning the, 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 the good name of a particular Pole. Um, he, he eventually he lost the first case but then won on appeal, which was a good thing, and a lot of academics and historians breathe a sigh of relief. But he wrote his op-ed about, about the problem of not Holocaust denial, in Poland, but Holocaust distortion, right? And I told this story earlier, sorry to the students who, have heard, heard, who will hear it again, but I think it bears repeating. Um, there's a new memorial near the town of Treblinka. Treblinka was a, one of uh, six major death camps where approximately 800,000 800, Jews were murdered. I'll say that again. 
Approximately 800,000 Jews were murdered. One non-Jewish Pole was shot dead for offering Jews on an incoming train some water. And the local authorities um, decided to erect a memorial to his memory for his heroic brave act. And it was heroic and brave. There's no question about that. The problem is, is that the way the memorial seems to imply things is an equivalency between 800,000 Jews murdered and one Pole murdered in order to allow Poles to essentially fool themselves into thinking that they were also victims. Some Poles were, there's no question, right? But that the nation itself was essentially victimized and it ends up pushing the mass murder of Jews, which is what the Holocaust was, pushing it off to the side and focusing instead on this one other narrative. Not, there's nothing not true about that, but it's a distortion. And so that's, that's politicization, right? And, um, you know, we need, to, we need to do what we can to fight against that. And our next question, as we memor memorialize racism, genocide, and other forms of fascism and horror, who should our intended audience be? Who shouldn't it be? <laughs> Good <Sorry>. point. <laughs> should I say more? Alrighty. Um, our last question is, um, can you speak to the Jewish individuals and generations shortly after the Shoah who, for reasons of trauma and other reasons, did not wish to tell their story and to remember? Um, and like, in general, other victims of horrific events who wish to bury the past instead of remember it? Uh, let's just rephrase that a little bit because I think everybody who went through a traumatizing history, it's not that they don't remember. Um, I mean, trauma can block certain kinds of memories, but it's not like they don't remember. It's that maybe they don't want to share their memory and that is their right, that is their choice. Um, my, uh, our, now, our now dear retired rabbi um, at Young Israel in Hollywood, Fort Lauderdale, uh, Rabbi Edward Davis, I, I think he's actually from Richmond originally, um, would, always, would always say that, you know, and he was quoting someone else, I, I don't remember who he was quoting, but that Holocaust survivors are, are they're, they're like, they're, they, they themselves are embodiments of holiness. And we cannot question what any of them choose to say or not to say. Um, you know, I, and a lot of other people, I'm very grateful to those who did choose to share their stories. Um, you know, especially now as uh, fewer and fewer survivors of the Holocaust are around, as, as, as time passes, you know, that article about um, the barn, uh, the Emmett Till site, um, pointed out that there are only a couple of still living witnesses to the entire gruesome episode. And so, you know, having the, the testimonies, having the narratives, having the first person accounts of what happened, are they're, they're treasured, treasured documents, artifacts, recordings, whatever they are. And I'm grateful that we have them from the Holocaust and from other um, instances of genocide and, and mass violence because they are so, so important to preserve the memory and the narrative and the account of what 
happened and how it impacted the people. I, I often talk to my students about primary and secondary sources and thinking about the sources of our knowledge, the sources of our information. How do we get, you know, how do we know what we know? Where are we getting it from? And to question those sources and to question the, the information and the, the provenance of that information. And so these accounts are absolutely valuable. But I, I don't blame anyone who might choose, who might have chosen not to share um, because it is re-traumatizing to give testimony and we can't require anyone to have to go through that again. All right, well that's all we have, but thank you very much thank for you. speaking. Thank you all. <laughs>this is on okay thank you just wanted to thank all of you so much for being here in community and learning this very difficult topic together thank you have a good evening